Welcome to Church of the Open Bible's Christmas Eve service. I'm Pastor Joe, and on behalf of the staff and the church in general, I'd like to wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas. Well, to open our Christmas Eve service today, I thought it'd be very fitting to read the words of Isaiah prophesying the coming of Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. So Isaiah says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's just have a short time of prayer right now. Lord, we thank you that we are able to have this Christmas Eve service to celebrate that, that you have come, that uh, a child was given, and, and Lord, that Jesus was born. And though Christmas looks a little bit different for us this year, and a lot has changed, we know that that truth does not change. That you came, Lord, that, that you are wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. And that is unchanging. And we thank you for that. And so, Lord, we pray that today we would keep that truth in mind and, and that we, we would have just a, a good time of, of worshiping you today through this service and, and through this holiday season, that we would remember that truth and we would worship and glorify you because of it. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Hey everyone, I just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and I wanted to let you know that even though you might not be able to have extended family into your home, there's still lots of things that you can do this Christmas season just with your immediate family. And this is going to be our gift to you this Christmas season. So it's a nativity escape room. So this is for you guys to work at home with your family. It uh, takes anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes to solve all the puzzles and the riddles. Um, unfortunately, at this uh, time, we cannot post this on our website. So we are offering you copies in person that you will have to come to the church and pick up. They will be available starting uh, Sunday, December 27th. Even if you haven't registered for church, you can come to the door and just say, we'd like uh, an escape room package. Um, and if you can't come on Sunday, it'll be here available for you at the church all week long. Come on in, stop and get your copy of the Nativity Escape Room and have loads of fun with your family. So until the new year, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. Luke 1, 26 to 33. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Thank you. 
is Emmanuel. Shall I come to thee, O Israel? I will now read Luke 2, verses 1 to 7. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. verses 8 to 12. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their shops, flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Sing choirs of angels singing in 
exaltation O sing all ye bright hosts of heaven above glory to God all glory in the highest O come let us adore him O come let us adore him O come let us adore him Christ the Lord Yea, Lord, we greet thee Born this happy morning Jesus, to thee be all glory Word of the Father Now in flesh appearing Oh, come let us adore Him Oh, come let us adore Him Oh, come let us adore Him Christ the Lord Luke 2 verses 13 and 14. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. God and sinners reconciled, joyful all ye nations cry, join the triumph of the sky, with angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King, Christ by heart. Offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus or Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven, Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lay his glory by, born that men no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give. Second birth, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Luke chapter 2, verses 15 to 20. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to them, said to each other, pardon me, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart 
and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace. And wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love. Aren't those such good words that we've, we've been able to sing so far today? The words that we just sang, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Praise God, the Lord has come. You know, at the, at the fullness of time, at the prophesied town of Bethlehem, the Savior, Christ, and Lord was born. And that, that is good news. Good news of great joy, as the angels proclaimed. And for that, we ought to praise God. Sometimes I think at Christmas time, though we know that truth, it can be so easy to forget why it is that Jesus actually came to earth. We know that he came. We know that this is good news of great joy, but the question still remains as to why that is such good news. Well, if you probably maybe are already there, Luke chapter 2, you've been reading in it so far already this service. Uh, open up to there again, Luke chapter 2, and I just want to read the words of the angels in verse 13 and 14. And in this passage in Luke chapter 2, we see two great purposes as to why Jesus is born. And we also see, explain to us why it is good news that Jesus came. So Luke chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. It says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So just in those two short verses, we see the two great purposes as to why it is that Jesus came to earth. The two great purposes are God's glory and our peace. So we're going to look at both of those two reasons as to why Jesus came down to earth separately and then look at the end as to how we ought to respond to those two things in our own lives. How we should respond to the fact that Jesus came so that God may have glory and so that we may have peace. So first, let's look at how Jesus' birth brings about glory to God. Well, biblically, to glorify God or to give God glory means to attribute him praise, honor, and worth. It's not that we give worth to God. It's that he is the one who is worthy. Thus, we praise him. We honor him. And so when someone does those things, when someone does praise, honor, and, and attribute God worth, God gets glory. Another way to think about attributing God glory is that it's making his greatness known. To say, how great is our God? That is giving God glory. And so with that definition for giving God glory in mind, we can see clearly how in Jesus' birth, the result is God being given glory. Even just this announcement of this baby being born gives God glory. If we look again at verse 13 and 14, what do we see the angels do? At the end of verse 13, it says that they are praising God. And the first words out of this heavenly host's mouths is glory to God. See, the angels are outpouring their adoration for God. It's not enough for just one angel to, to give this glory to God, because at first there was just the one angel who appeared to the shepherds and said, 
there is this good news of great joy. But when it came to praising God, to giving God glory, it wasn't enough for just the one to be there. No, the heavenly hosts, the armies of angels, came to glorify God, saying, glory to God in the highest. And that's, that's amazing. They, they were adoring God, giving him glory. And when I think of those verses in 13 and 14, I can't help but also think of Psalm 148, verses 1 to 2, which I think is just a great explanation for exactly what's going on here in Luke chapter 2. And so Psalm 148, verses 1 through 2 say, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. And that's exactly what we see happening in Luke chapter 2. As the hosts of heaven, the angels are praising God, giving God glory. Because Jesus had come to earth and was born in a manger. Well, it's not just the angels that give God glory surrounding this birth of Jesus. No, it's God's glory is seen throughout the whole account. If you go back in your Bible to Luke chapter 1, verses 46 and 47, we read a part of Mary's song when she finds out that she's going to give birth to the Messiah, to Jesus. And she says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and I am going to give God glory. That's in Luke 1, verses 46 and 47. It's clear there, Mary is giving God glory because the Messiah has come. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, after he had gone mute, he receives his speech again after naming his son John, and he too says, I will glorify God. I'm giving God glory because I know that the Messiah is coming. He says that in Luke chapter 1, verses 68 and 69. Let's look at the shepherd's response here in Luke chapter 2, verse 20. What does it say that they do? The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. The shepherds glorified and praised God. We see God's glory throughout this whole account. Even later on, as Jesus is a little bit older, he's presented at the temple. In, in Luke chapter 2, 28 and verse 38, we hear about these two elderly folks, Simeon and Anna, who have been waiting their whole lives for the Messiah to come. And now they see this eight-year-old baby boy. They know that he is the Messiah. He is the Savior. And they, too, give God glory as a result of this baby being born. So it's clear the birth of Christ brought about glory being given to God. And this glory being attributed to God doesn't just end at Jesus' birth. It actually continues throughout Jesus' whole life. Whether that be the disciples who give glory to God at times throughout Jesus' ministry, those who Jesus did miracles for would, would often say glory to God. They would give glory to God recognizing that ultimately God is worthy of the praise of the fact that they were healed by Jesus. Jesus himself even gives glory to God during his life and ministry on earth. In fact, even in Jesus' death and his resurrection, God is glorified. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 12, verses 27 through 28. This is about a week before Jesus goes to the cross to die, and he knows that that's coming up. He knows that he's about to die. But listen to the words that Jesus says. He says, my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. That's what Jesus says. Father, I want you to be glorified. I want to give you glory, even through my death. And then a voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. So even in the death of Christ, God says, I will be glorified. I will receive glory even through the death of my son, Jesus. You know, maybe that seems a little bit backwards, but the reality is that God did receive glory 
by Jesus' death on the cross. God's name was made great as a result, just as God said it would in John chapter 12. And of course, God was also glorified as Jesus, we know, did not remain dead, but rose on the third day. And that caused, at the time, and should and does continue to cause today, many people to give God glory. And all of this, all of this glory to God comes about because Jesus came to earth, because he was born in a major, God incarnate, at the perfect time in the town of Bethlehem. That one day, that one event, has brought much glory to God, just as the angels proclaimed in Luke chapter 2. So there we see just a glimpse of how Jesus' birth brings about glory to God. But we still need to ask, how does Jesus' birth bring about the second half of the angel's proclamation in Luke 2 verse 14, being peace on earth? How did Jesus coming to earth bring about peace? Well, to be honest, I find this proclamation that the angels make to be really interesting. Because if we consider the time and the place where Jesus was born, peace is not necessarily a word that we would use to categorize that, that time or that place. As we know, Jesus was Jewish. He was born in Bethlehem, in Judea. And Judea at that time was under Roman rule. Yes, they had a king in Herod, but Herod was in cahoots with Rome. And Rome had its thumb right over Judea. And really, the, again, the last word, the last adjective I think anybody would use to describe the Romans' reign would be peaceful. Uh, specifically when it came to how they dealt with the Jews. They were specifically harsh with the Jewish people. But here we see it. The angels say that this baby is coming to bring peace. It's fair to say that the Jewish people assumed that this peace that the Messiah would bring, even as we read earlier in Isaiah chapter 9, that he would be a prince of peace. I think it's fair to say that the Jewish people assumed that that meant there would be peace and Rome would no longer be ruling over them. Well, I guess, unfortunately for, for the Jewish people who were thinking that at the time, that's not actually the peace that this baby was bringing. Today, when we hear the word peace, I think often people think of this idea of world peace, where there's no war, all the countries are getting along, uh, and life is just hunky-dory, but that's not the peace that Jesus is speaking, that Jesus was bringing either, that the angels spoke of. No, the peace that this baby brought was so much more, so much better than either of those things. The angels could sing on earth peace among those in whom he is pleased because they knew that the peace Jesus came to bring was first and foremost peace between man and God. Since the Garden of Eden, since Adam's original sin, there has not been peace between man and God and God. A perfect, holy God could not be in the presence of sinners, could not be in right relationship with man because man had sinned. But still, God had a plan. God had a plan to make peace between himself and man. And so God the Father sent his son, Jesus, to earth to make peace peace, to reconcile us as humans to God. And Jesus did. He came to earth, as we know. Jesus lived a perfect life, giving us the perfect example of how we ought to live our lives, caring for those who were, were broken down, who were poor, who were in need of help. Both physically and spiritually, he cared for them, giving us the example of what we ought to do as well. And we know that Jesus was fully man and fully God, which is very significant as to how he could actually reconcile man and God, because Jesus was both man and God. 
And to see how Jesus actually ended up bringing that peace, we must once again go to the cross. At the cross, Jesus was man's perfect representative. He was the spotless lamb, the perfect sacrifice, taking the sins of mankind on himself, facing the wrath of his father, the wrath of God, that we as sinners deserve. And why? Why did Jesus do this? To bring us peace. Jesus did this so that humans may once again have right relationship with God. Romans 5 verse 1 states it very well when it says, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God through Jesus Christ. So it's because of Jesus' death on the cross that we have that peace with God. And that is good news. You know, when we consider that, it's no wonder that the whole heavenly host of angels comes down and says, glory to God. Yeah, it's worth praising God because he brought us peace. He's reconciled us back to himself. That is unbelievably great news. We can't even fathom how great of news that is. But Romans 5 verse 1, which I read just, just earlier, makes it clear that this peace comes to those who have been justified by faith. That means we can only have that peace with God that Jesus provides. We can only have that right relationship with God if we actually put our faith in Jesus. That's what it means by when it says we are justified by faith. So we ought to believe that Jesus has paid the price that we deserved when he died on the cross. That he rose again from the grave, that he ascended to the right hand of the Father. We need to believe that, put our faith in Jesus, believing that that is true in order to receive the peace that God has offered us through his Son. And when we respond to God about this in faith, we will not only have peace with God, which we will, but Colossians 3.15 tells us that the peace of Christ will rule in our hearts. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with, with you all today. As I've been preparing for this sermon, as I came across Colossians 3.15, I felt a, the sting of some conviction. As the all the regulations have, have continued to be announced surrounding COVID, I must admit there were times when I felt far from peace. I felt anxious. I felt frustrated. I felt angry. I didn't feel peace. And then preparing for this sermon, I come across Colossians 3.15, which says that the peace of Christ will rule in our hearts if we have faith in Jesus. And I could not help but feel that conviction. And so I prayed and asked, Lord, please, please give me that peace. I don't want to be frustrated. I don't want to be fed up with, with these regulations, especially at this time of year, when we know that this time of year we celebrate the fact that Jesus has come to bring us peace. And sure enough, I prayed and I, I felt and I knew that peace of Christ ruling in my heart. And I've, I'm sure many of us have felt similarly throughout this, this time of COVID, where we haven't felt peace. But we can feel that peace. We can have that peace of Christ ruling in our hearts as believers, because we know that he is in control, that he is good, and he has a plan. And so the long story short is, because Jesus came to earth and was born in a manger, we may know peace. We may know peace in our hearts and peace with God. And that peace comes from God himself. So as we've seen then, the purpose for Jesus coming to earth was clear. As the angel said, Jesus came so that God may get glory and so that we may have peace. But to close, I just want to ask the question, how do we respond to this? Well, first and foremost, we should respond if you have not yet responded to God in faith. You should do so. 
You should respond to God in faith so that you may know that peace which God offers us, that God gives us through Jesus Christ. So I would, I would urge you, it's my heart's desire that you would respond to all this by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And then you will, you will experience, you will know the peace that passes all understanding that comes from God. You'll have a right relationship with the God of the universe. And we read earlier that the angels sang glory to God. Well, Jesus says in Luke 15, verse 10, that the angels rejoice in heaven over the sinner who repents. And so if you put your faith in Jesus, we can know that just as the angels sang glory to God and they rejoiced when that baby was born, so they will rejoice when we are born again, when we put our faith in Jesus. And so that's how we ought to respond. Our first and foremost response, if we have not done so yet, is to put our faith in Jesus. Well, our second response ought to be similar to that of the shepherds of Luke chapter 2, who, when they heard the good news of great joy, when they heard that there was peace through Jesus Christ, they did not keep that news to themselves, but they went and made it known and shared that good news of great joy with others. And so we, we should do likewise. This Christmas season, though maybe we can't gather with friends and family as we'd like to, even as we FaceTime or talk on the phone with friends and family, as we come across people on the street, outside on the ski hill or sledding or at the rink, wherever we might be, let's share that good news of great joy. Let's make known that Christ has come and there is peace in him and in him alone. This is the greatest possible news and we must be willing and eager to share that news. And so that is response number two. And finally, our last response, or maybe our first response to all this, should be giving God glory. God has been so good to us. He made a way for us to be in right relationship with him. He's blessed us abundantly. He's given us peace. And so with the angels, we should say, glory to God in the highest. We should praise him, for certainly he is the only one who is worthy of our praise. So let's respond in praise now with the word of prayer and our closing song, which is Angels We Have Heard on High. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that you sent your Son down to earth. And Lord, we thank you that that brought you glory and continues to bring you glory. And we pray that we would honor and glorify you today because of that good news of great joy. And Lord, we thank you that you made a way to reconcile us to yourself. And that way was through Jesus, who brings us peace, peace with you and peace in our hearts. Lord, help us to know that peace this season. And, and help us to share that peace with others. It'd be silly to do anything other than share that, that great news, that there is peace in you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would do that. And, and I thank you once again, Lord, that Jesus came to earth, born of a virgin, so that we could have peace. And I pray these things right now in your name. Amen. See
Thank you again all for joining us for this Christmas Eve service. I hope and trust that you were blessed by this and um, that it was a good reminder for us to glorify God this season and that we have peace. To close the service, I'd like to read once again from Romans chapter 5, verse 1, which says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that is such great news. And so I'd like to wish you all once again a Merry Christmas on behalf of the church and the staff and, uh, and a Happy New Year as well. Blessings.